All right, I'm going to go ahead and begin. I'm a neurologist. Uh, when I gave this talk uh, for Dr. Stefani, I said uh, it's, a, it's an embarrassing time to be a neurologist. Uh, my son, uh, in May of last year, uh, developed a double vision and a facial uh, weakness. Uh, he was hospitalized for three or four days, saw three neurologists, had all sorts of uh, tests, was diagnosed with ADEM. So I have not been in this, in the MS world. I went straight into research for the last 25 years. And so I said, wow, great, they've made a lot of progress since I was a resident. Uh, well, no, they hadn't. Uh, so in December, uh, he then developed ascending numbness uh, up to his chest, and he was diagnosed with MS. So I decided it was time for me to catch up on literature. And uh, what I discovered was that no progress had been made. And it was my wife who said, well, you should be reading about this guy who uh, makes uh, ice skating rink uh, devices. Uh, and I said, no, I, this is too crazy to believe. But she was persistent. And uh, so here I am today, uh, basically, to jump the story forward. I went, and visit, I went to the Hamilton conference that uh, Mark put on, met everybody. Uh, Spent several days with Mark in uh, Wayne State, learned his method of evaluating the Hakey Protocol, brought it to San Diego where I run an fMRI facility, so I had the same scanner that uh, Mark uses, a Siemens 3T, that is also able to do SWI. And uh, sure enough, uh, we sent, sent the images to Mark. Sure enough, uh, my son had obstructions, uh, so I found a, an interventionist. I, I, found one that uh, was very experienced but did his stuff at a very small hospital that had a very weak neurology department, uh, arranged to have him, my son done. My son had severe obstruction of the jugulars and the azagus. Uh, his, in, all the symptoms went away, even symptoms, uh, something called a lermite sign, kind of an electric shock that goes down the back when you, when you bend your neck. Uh, also, his personality totally changed. He was really an asshole for several years there. <laughs> we actually went all into uh, group therapy together because he was just so inappropriate. He's now, a number of you, I believe, have spoken to uh, to Devin um, on the phone or on, by email. Uh, just a totally different person, outgoing, uh, easygoing, uh, doesn't, stress doesn't bother him anymore. Uh, and then my next challenge, of course, was to get IRB. Uh, this was right around the time that Mark was having trouble getting his IRB. Dake had been shut down at Stanford. So I decided I really needed to put on my Machiavellian hat and uh, figure out a way to get an IRB. So I went to the same smaller hospital that didn't have a strong neurology department. And I came up with an IRB that uh, was not confrontational, was not uh, uh, too fancy. Uh, and we were able to slide right through. So in June, we got IRB approval. So now we've started, we've uh, now done maybe 30, 30, scan, uh, 30 of the Hakey protocol, and we've done um, about 15 treatments with the, uh, with the IRs uh, in San Diego. So I want to go through with you uh, this, this literature. So the orthodox, what, what, what I was taught 25 years ago and what the neurologists are still telling patients today, is that uh, MS is an attack by the immune system on myelin, right? That's what autoimmune means. It means that the immune system thinks that myelin is a foreign substance and is attacking it, right? That's what we've all been taught. So let's just talk about that. First of all, the viral theory has not been validated. The autoimmune theory has not been validated. You don't sort of hear that when you're talking to a neurologist. But if you look at the literature, and I'm about to read you two uh, devastating quotes from, from, the, from the literature, uh, the medications are marginally effective. They, uh, the neurologists pride themselves in their huge trials. Think about it. Why do you need a huge trial? It's because the effect is so small that in order to get enough power, you have to do huge trials. It's not a good thing that you do to do huge trials. It's a sign of the weakness of the method that you have to do huge trials. Uh, and then it's dangerous, right? We know it's is dangerous, uh, but, but all of them are. are these, these medications, they call them disease-modifying drugs. These are immunosuppressants. They would use steroids if they could. Right? You can't use steroids chronically because of the side effects. So these are drugs that are basically trying to be like steroids, only with less side effects. That's what they're doing. They kill white cells. Right? That's how they're working. Right? 
So let me read you. This is from the main textbook. This is the main textbook on MS. I'm going to read this whole long thing because it's so devastating. The possibility of being in a primary infectious process with or without an associated autoimmune reaction has not been entirely ruled out despite repeated failure to identify a causative agent. Over the last four decades, at least 14 different viruses have been isolated from the brains of MS patients, yet none has been shown to be etiologically related causative. Cook listed 22 agents suspected of being related to MS for which substantial evidence of a causal role has not thus far been appeared. This is from a prominent researcher at the University of Glasgow. This is published this year. These significant data seem to have been ignored by some who are willing to defend the theory that MS is an autoimmune disease mediated by immunopathological mechanisms despite overwhelming evidence to the contrary. Studies of these agents showed that the inability to go beyond the 33% line raised the possibility the entire observed benefit is only a placebo effect. It can be argued that over the years, the autoimmune hypotheses have been harmful to a considerable number of patients. Basic studies on, on speculative immunological mechanisms are continually shown to be It is clear that modern research should move away from the autoimmune theory. So what is the Zamboni theory? Uh, the, the focus by the IRs, of course, is on the, the cool anatomy or the wild anatomy. Right? I mean, that, that's the problem, right? The venous system is so variable. Think about the veins that you can see on your arms. Everybody's veins are a little different. Uh, even on your two sides, they're a little bit different. That's been part of the problem. That's why I never even heard the word azagus in my medical training. We didn't care. It's like, who cares about the storm drains in your street, right? You care about the water supply in. You don't care about the drain. As long as it's not stopping up your toilet, who cares about things? I think, I think in general in medicine, part of the problem we've had is we just didn't pay attention to veins. They were sort of, you know, the leftover stuff. So everyone is having to go through this education. The IRs are way ahead of everybody else. And there were, uh, I remember not so long ago looking at uh, Mark's images, and I couldn't tell uh, the jugular from the vertebral from the external jugular. It was just a uh, very confusing anatomy. So that's, that's part of the challenge we have. So that's the anatomy. But what, what, what's the theory? So what's he shown, basically? He's shown that uh, Doppler and MR venography have obstructions, right? Now, now the debate becomes, well, more than in normals, and so, so far, that's still going on, right? Uh, Zamboni basically found 100%. Zavodinov at Buffalo is sort of aiming more than 55 60%. This guy in, in uh, Germany, his name is Dope. I mean, it's just not a great name. D-O-E-P-P, -P, right? This, he, he found none for the reasons that Stefani mentioned. Uh, so there's going to be that issue, what, what percentage. So that's the first thing Zamboni is. He found a lot of abnormalities that no one expected. Then he treated some of them, and a whole lot of people got better. So that's the second debate. Well, how many are going to get better? How many are not going to get better? That, that's an issue that we're still going to have to figure out. What is the theory? So his theory, and I, I, think, um, I think this would be Mark's theory too, to give him a chance to put him on the spot there. Backflow causes damage to the small veins in the central nervous system, which leads to leakage of uh, red blood cells and iron into the central nervous system, which leads to inflammation. Now, I, I, I think that's the theory, but I don't really feel that theory has been really carefully articulated yet. But that's basically what my understanding is, that the delayed flow is, pre is putting uh, pressure on the venial. So you have arteries, arterioles, capillaries. Capillaries are so thin, literally one blood cell, cell goes through them at a time. And then they widen. That's called the venial, and then they become a vein. So... The MS, the, the neurological symptoms are not being caused in the neck. They're being caused in the central nervous system, in the cortex. Uh, so the big vessels aren't there. It's the venules in the white matter and, and the cortex. That's where, that's where uh, the damage is being done. So red blood cells leaking, in, leaking the endothelium is weakened. The endothelium is the lining of the vein. It's weakened. Red cells get through. Iron gets through, and then that incites an inflammatory response. I think that's reasonable, but that's not what my own theory is. I think that, in fact, what's happening is that 
You don't want a swamp. You don't want a stagnant swamp in your brain. Those cells need to be clearing their, uh, clearing their environment out continuously. Uh, you don't want the, the, uh, the debris of, of uh, uh, you want your toilet flushing, right? You don't want to leave that environment just sitting there. Uh, and that uh, a slowed, swamped, stagnated environment weakens the oligodendrocytes, the oligodendrocytes are the cells that make myelin, that, that, that because the oligodendrocytes are weakened, perhaps there's too much nitric oxide, perhaps there's uh, too leftover uh, neurotransmitters, glutamate uh, is, has been uh, accused of being uh, a toxin to oligodendrocytes. The myelin falls apart, and the white cells are coming in to clean up the debris. That's actually what has been shown. There's a scavengering going on. The white cells are not coming in to attack myelin. The white cells are coming in to clean up myelin that is fragmented and been damaged by a stagnant uh, swamp. So uh, there, there are different theories, uh, but I think this is the challenge for neurology going forward is, okay, uh, we, we see these, uh, these obstructions way out peripherally, but, but what's, what's that doing to the brain? Why is this pathology actually happening? So I'm 